Richard North, I'm delighted to have you on Coffee for Scalers today about scaling businesses. Um, you're the biggest TV celebrity we've ever had on Coffee for Scalers from Undercover Boss, Channel 4. Go watch it if you've never watched it before. This episode is going to be kind of like a how you built it business wars type episode about the good, the bad and the ugly of scaling a business. So welcome, Richard. Hello, Dennis, and thanks for having me on the show. You're great. Um, how's life, first of all? Life's good. Um, I, I suppose I'm an, an optimist generally, so um, I'm yeah. always looking for the glass to be half full. <laughs> oh, good, 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 good. Great. So, um, yeah, Richard, I guess just for the uh, for the audience, first of all, can you explain a little bit about like um, your experience in building businesses and uh, obviously the founder and CEO of Wow Stuff, but just over your career to start off would be great. Uh, yeah, I, I suppose a, a life as an entrepreneur is um, is my background. Um, I left school with no qualifications um, of any note, um, so very basic um, in those days, O-levels um, and CSE oh, yeah. grades, and didn't do university and found myself looking around for a job about three months before I was due to leave school. Oh, and wow. uh, so the start of my career was um, working in an office. I, I was lucky enough to to get a job. Um, it was it was tough at the time. A lot of you know, unless you got good qualifications, um, yeah, yeah it, it was hard. They had things like the uh, the youth training scheme, I think it was called YTS, um, for people that left school with few qualifications. And this was almost like a um, an, um, uh, a study place at a business that you could kind of get a semi-qualification from. Anyway, I, I ended up in this office. They had a direction for me originally, oh, yeah. but but they left me to my own devices. I'd turn up for work, I'd walk in this office, and, and uh, I would see somebody every so often, but I, I was just left to it. And I thought, well, if I don't add value, in what I'm going to do today, at some point I'll get found out and I'll yeah. get fired. So um, I set about making sales calls. So that was the, the early stages of my my career. I was I got into sales by default, not by design. Oh wow! So you actually took the initiative in the company you're working in to like do sales? Yeah, and through fear, really, it was wow. that fear of well, if I, as I say, if I don't add value, then why would they keep me? So I yeah. picked up the phone and I started doing these outbound sales. And within a few months, we built some good relationships with the retailers that we sold to, that I was selling yeah. to the phone. We were driving some really good business and uh, it was great. I got recognized for, for what I was doing by the bosses at the company. Um, and I remember at the end of the very first year working at that business, the tax man gave me a check for about three hundred pounds, yeah, which was more than my monthly wage. And what had happened is they'd been deducting tax at source, but I was earning so little, I wasn't due to pay any tax. And the tax man had calculated that I was due this refund. Um, uh, so, so yeah, very low wage. And then I thought, you know, sales I enjoy. And somebody approached me and said come and work for us. I went for an interview, asked, asked them how much money it was. And, uh, and they said 8,000 pounds was my salary, which was yeah. two and a half times or more than that, than I was currently earning. Plus a company car. Yeah. The prestige of that. That was a real, yeah, wow. yeah. um, but you know, I, I did hesitate and I had to ask around, you know, a few friends, what should I do? Um, they all thought I was mad having to ask. My fear then was I'd never driven outside of my hometown, you know, and I was yeah. a little bit scared, a bit nervous, apprehensive about taking on this role. And what if I'm really being overpaid for the for the role? Yeah. I'm not good enough. I think we all go through that at various yeah. times of life. So um, that was a concern, but I got reassured by family and friends. So I took I took the next role, the next jump in my career to become a sales rep oh nice and and was that in the toy industry still or a different industry no i started off in my in, in the photographic industry oh and selling cameras and camera accessories 
drive yeah. with lights, lenses, that kind of stuff. Um, that was my early part of my career. I did that for seven years. And at the age of 26, um, really, again, this goes to the sort of the ups and downs of probably yeah. any, anybody in business. But And also, as I was about to become an entrepreneur, I, the two guys that owned the group that I worked for were very successful entrepreneurs themselves. They'd mm. built a fabulous business doing about 25 million pounds in sales. And of course, this was now the late 80s. So probably the equivalent of about 40 million pounds in sales in today's money, 60 million dollars there. Yeah. And, there. and um, I thought, well, I've had these promotions. I was very fortunate that I had a great mentor who helped me. Uh, you know, I was very green, obviously, when I joined, made loads mm -hmm. of mistakes. At one point, I had the record for more car accidents <laughs> than the whole of the company um, employees combined who had company cars. So, you know, this is... Nothing too serious, I hope. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, well, well, I had a few bad ones, but no, I, I was yeah. able to, you know, not hurt anybody else and, and dust myself off off and, and kind of you know get back on the road um yeah i didn't realize i actually got sleep apnea so i was i was oh. actually falling asleep um you know a lot I, I would do my eight calls well i try to do my eight calls a day as a sales rep in territory yeah after doing my first call i'd be tired i'd pull mm. over in a lie or a car park sleep for 20 minutes uh oh. then get back up and go and drive on to my next call I'd arrive yeah. 20 minutes later, half an hour later, sleep for 20 minutes, then do that call. And so, so I could only fit in about five calls a day. And I would always come last in number of calls per day as they measured every rep for how many yeah. calls they did. And I'd come first for total sales value each month. Wow. Your conversion so rate I, is really high. I was over yeah. indexing, yeah, over indexing in one area and massively yeah. under indexing in another. So, yes, yeah, so I. Picture, they call it in baseball, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So okay. I, I did that for seven years, sales rep, became sales manager, and, and ended up running a small company within the group that I grew successfully over sort of 36 months, and then decided to leave and set up my first company. Oh, cool. And did you always want to be an entrepreneur? Um, I, I didn't know um, what my ambitions were when I was at school. I didn't have anything, um, you know, fixated in my mind about where I wanted to be. And it mm. came around about 19 years old in that first job. I was, I got off the bus on the way into work and uh, I had this very cheap suit and tie and it was a very wet, sludgy, wintry day. So where all the snow, because of the traffic, um, had actually turned black with, with a combination of smoke and dirt and grime on the roads. And I jumped yeah. off the bus, jumped straight into a big, thick pool of this sludge. And I remember looking down and my, my, my shoes were sodden, completely wet. And the bottoms of my trousers were filthy black mud so they were light gray trousers that had now gone black and they were filthy and as i walked into work the, the the half a mile from the bus stop to get to my office a car pulls up and it was a bentley a beautiful wow. bentley the window wound down and and the guy leaned over and said i think you work for me jump in i'll give you a lift to the rest to the rest of the way and it was the owner of the company this entrepreneur yeah. so i very nervously jumped into his car passenger side and I remember looking down in the footwell and seeing all this black sludge coming off my trousers onto his cream beautifully manicured lamb's wool carpets and I thought great I'm gonna get fired um and and I said to him look I'm really sorry don't worry about it he said and 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 I remember you know nice guy he was an incredible inventor himself and I looked at him and thought, that's what I want. I, I want the riches that go with success. I want the success and the, um, the adoration that I held him in, but so many other people did. And I thought, yeah. God, you could get all those things if you, if you become an entrepreneur. So I suppose that was, my, what, that was one of my drivers. 
uh, to be an entrepreneur. The driver to make money was, um, I, I don't think I've spoken about this uh, before on record, but my brother was was handicapped. So at birth, he was fine. But five years later at school, he had a stroke. The headmaster oh. thought he was being lazy all day. And when my mum came to pick him up, um, the headmaster actually said to, to my mum, he's been lazy, he hasn't wanted to work all day. She realised something was wrong, took him to the hospital, then they said he'd had a stroke and he never recovered properly. And so um, through my early years, I suppose I always felt that whatever happened, whatever I ended up doing, I would have to look after my brother because my mum and dad yeah. aren't going to be here forever and he can't fend for himself. So that was a big uh, driver for me to make, try and make money. Wow, wow, what a story. Yeah, wow. And... Um... I was going to say, and then from the initial, like, so you wanted to be an entrepreneur. How did you make it happen then? Like, was it a great idea, a gap in the market? Um, so, yes, it, it was, it was, <laughs> it was part of the roller coaster. The reason I started my first company at yeah. the age of 27 was because. I'd done well at that business for that seven years or so, that, that second company that I became the rep and then the sales manager, and then the yeah. manager running a division. And then they sold the business. They cashed in, the owners. Yeah. And we were then part of a stock market listed company that was in the press as having the one of the finest CEOs this country has ever created. And, yeah. um and he was going to build this this huge consumer leisure products business. Far from it. The guy was a disaster. Uh, he started acquiring lots of businesses. The cultural fit of the different businesses uh, was not compatible. Yeah, uh, People were leaving or being fired right, left and center. And I thought, this is not what I want. Um, they offered me a redundancy package, so I took it. And then set about um, setting up my first company. I knew I would be fired at some point or let go, you know, made redundant if yeah. I did, if I didn't be wasn't sort of proactive in in getting. Yeah. Redundant. But I didn't have anything to do. I didn't have a big plan in my mind yeah. of what I was going to then do. I didn't have a business plan. I just knew I would somehow end up on my feet, and I yeah. had a very can-do attitude, a very positive outlook. Yeah. And when you when you have that sometimes, it can it can go for you and it can go against you. You know, being that eternal optimist, yeah. things things backfire and don't go as you expected, and they can be very disappointing. But but equally, I think I do believe it's always still better to be positive as you approach anything. You yeah. know, positive in, positive out. Yeah. Uh, so with that, I took the money. I think it was about seven thousand pounds. Uh, from memory and somebody called me up a week after being made redundant and I got a mortgage I was living on my own so I got got my first house and now had no car and, and a friend called me up and said I desperately need some money for something and the money that I was going to use to set up my company I gave it to him um, oh. it, I, I did believe it was a good cause and I believe it was a good cause to this day um, but I now had no money which, yeah. which is, you know, not something that I would recommend anybody else do. You know, you, you know, you have to look after yourself, first of all, before you can start looking after anybody else. So yeah. you have to secure your own position. That's what means you'll stay sane and you'll still be able to provide. Um, but I didn't. And I, I made my first big mistake. I then found it, uh, you know, wow, how am I going to pay the mortgage? But again, I suppose... The need to have to pay a mortgage, yeah. The need to have to try and earn some money to live on. Yeah, you know, I, didn't, I didn't come from a wealthy background. My parents yeah. um, were sort of one up from a, a council house, very low earners, so so they didn't have any money. Um, meant that I had to do something. So back yeah. against the wall, I phoned around all my old customers, and I was to tell them I was I was I just left the company, and they said, "What am I going to do?" Um, I was I was quite surprised by how many said, "Richard, you can't leave. It's it's a great business. You know, we we love buying the products you used to sell us. 
and and I did have moments of um, uncertainty then very much. I was really, I was thinking, my goodness me. So if I set up my own business and have to create my own products and brands, yeah. they still love the old products that I used to sell. They, they, their loyalty almost appears to be with them and not me, as I yeah. perhaps falsely believed, you know. Um, so anyway, I forged ahead. I was very fortunate. Two of my customers offered to support me in a business um, wow. on, on the basis that they put in the cash and I oh. put in. I put in the sweat, and then we yeah. split it, we put in the, we split the equity then fifty fifty. So oh wow! So that's how I started my first company at the. And you had your first two clients as well, as well as investors. Um, yes, I did actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah both of yeah. them stayed as, as as clients. Yes. Yeah. They so it limited your risk. Very yeah. supportive. Yes. Yeah. Uh, cool. And that first business was that in the toy sector? It was in a completely different sector again. <laughs> what was it yeah i was uh, um one of my hobbies um was um a target shooting yeah and uh, at the age of 18 i was a world champion target shooter <laughs> and the first world champion target shooter we've ever had is episode seven <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is bringing back memories oh my goodness yeah. um so i uh, yeah i I took the knowledge of the industry and did a deal with an American company to represent their products in the UK. Yeah. Um, flew out to see them to make the presentation along with my finance partner. And um, they took a flyer on me. Now, they, I remember walking into this huge boardroom and, and the president of the company was at one end of the board table and his colleagues were down the sides, either side of the table. And I was at the other end making a presentation. Yeah. On his deathbed, he wouldn't take calls from anybody but me. So he allowed one phone call and it was, and he allowed me. So I felt extremely privileged um, that I could speak to him um, in his final moments because this was the guy that helped me uh, perhaps more than any single person. Um, wow. You know, so uh, because he, he gave me all the stock to take into the UK and he trusted me so much. He gave he gave me that stock to, without any security at all, without putting up any cash. Wow! He gave yeah. me 120 days credit, and I was taking in you know a million dollars of stock at a time. Yeah. Um, and he didn't know me from Adam, but he said to me on his deathbed, Richard, I, I don't think you heard what I said when you very first came over to present to me. You were doing the pitch. And I said to you, probably because of your nerves, you, you misheard me or didn't hear me. But I said to you, I've been told that you're uh, not to be trusted, that you, um, you're not a good guy. And I don't believe that. And I know that, it, that at the time you didn't hear it. I don't believe you heard it. And I just want to tell you now, that is what I said. And, I, and the reason I backed you is because I knew from the minute you walked in the door and you started speaking that that wasn't the case. And, uh, wow. and, I, and I believed in my gut and I was right too. And good luck. Uh, and his name was wow. Fred, Fred Cosper was his oh, name. Wow. Wonderful man. And uh, yeah, and, and he helped me in business as my financial partner did as well. Uh, yeah. You know, Peter wow. What a great story. It reminds me of, um, um, what's it called again? Uh, Shoe Dog. Have you heard Phil Knight's story? Yeah. Phil Knight, Knight. yeah. Where, where he like got an agreement to do, um, Tiger who, Shoes. Tiger. Yes, Tiger Shoes. Yeah. But yeah. then he changed strategy. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, they did, they did something similar. You know, the, the bits I haven't mentioned here so far was, um, uh, twice before that story, I, I was stabbed in the back. And the, oh, yeah. and the people that spoke to Fred to tell him I shouldn't be trusted was one of the companies, uh, one of the people, the owner of a company that that I was about to compete with. So, yeah. he, so this guy got wind that I was going to go back into the industry, in, into this industry that he was in, yeah. and compete with him. I'd been around the industry at moments before mm. that, so he knew of me. And he didn't want me to set up in comp in competition with him, so he had okay. he was the guy that told bad manners, told, told yeah. Fred not to trust me. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, uh, oh. So that that that's wow. how it ended up. 
you, do you have any advice for people out there in terms of like, it sounds like so far over your career, relationships have been key, like, uh, or building relationships quickly, like in sales, right? You're going in the door, trying to make an impression quickly. Do you have any advice for people like earlier in their career and stuff around building strong relationships or trust? You know, it, you've got to be in it for the long haul. I would mm. say it's not going to come quickly because, some, you know, to build trust, with yeah. your customers um, is through repeated actions and, and repeated mm. meetings. You know, yes, you can get lucky where someone can get a good sense of you like Fred did with yeah. me. Yeah. But, but really, you know, 90% of the time, yeah. I've found it's being consistent um, yeah. and being trustworthy. Now, that's not to say I haven't made mistakes. You know, yeah. and people say, oh, you know, yeah, you, you trustworthy. Have you got high integrity? I know there would be people that say, oh, I don't like Richard. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust him. You know, most usually they're competitors because that's, that's competition. That's how they are. And, you know, I'm in it for my products to win and, and, yeah. and, and you know, my customers to win with my products. So naturally I'm going to be very competitive. But occasionally you do make a genuine mistake. You do the wrong thing. And, yeah. you know, you, as long as you recognize that, it's the people yeah. that do those wrong things and then don't believe they've done anything wrong. That, yeah. I worry, that I worry about. Yeah. And it's integral to them. It's, you yeah. know, uh, being untrustworthy is integral to them. So I know the difference, I believe. Yeah. You know, yeah. So if you make a mistake, put it right quickly. Yeah. Do the wrong yeah. Thing, admit it and put it right quickly. Yeah. 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 I'm sure that is not the norm. Yeah. 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 It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Like small things. Like I remember I went for, um, um, a dinner or a lunch recently in a business meeting and there's quite a few of us getting together and I didn't know the people, some of the people and I was, open I was going through the restaurant door and the person ahead of me like didn't look backwards they just closed the door ahead of me even though it was someone I was going to be sitting down with later and instantly I was like oh I don't know about this person so like it's interesting isn't it like what you're saying it's kind of like it reminds me of people asking about culture how do you build great culture you build great culture by doing the right things day in day out and setting good practices um yeah yeah, you're right. I think that's absolutely right, isn't it? You know, through your organization and through people you meet, you've got to be consistent. Yeah. Yeah. Consistent. Yeah. Cool. So wow stuff. What an amazing success and wow pods behind you. I can see um, yeah, your, yeah, your, your best, yeah. Yeah, your latest best product. Um, yeah. it, can you talk to the people who people who don't know about wow stuff, like the kind of scale you're at today? And then maybe we talk about that journey, if that works for you. Sure. Um, so we're a toy business. Um, we weren't always a toy business. And um, the last 10 years, we've been, um, at, well, we've had some, you know, again, roller coasters, uh, really, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but we're back into scaling mode uh, the last three years, particularly uh, having had a hiccup about um, six, seven years ago. Um, we're about working with the Big license brands, Harry Potter, Disney, you know, Marvel, um, you know, all those big names. Yeah. And we try to create products with that wow factor, you know, stuff that's very, very innovative that often has never been done before mm. or grabs um, ideas from lots of other areas and pulls multiple ideas oh, into, cool. into this product to make this product then unique in itself. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and uh, how many people is it, or like, a, uh, yeah, I'm not sure of size of revenues you're able to say as well, but yeah, how big is it? Yeah, we don't disclose our, our, our sales uh, numbers, but um, you know, we're 50 people. Um, we've yep. got a Hong Kong office, we have a UK uh, headquarters, and we have a small Los Angeles office. And right. we, yeah, we've grown the business. Um, very significantly in the first five years of trading, we were a Virgin Fast Track 100 company uh, twice, I think, in the first five years. Um, yeah. But we were a gifts business in the in the beginning, oh. and, and you know, there's a subtle difference between gifts and toys. So gifts, as the name suggests, are bought by people to give to somebody else, um, whereas toys whilst they are bought often by parents to give to the kids, it's the kids that, that usually ask their parents for that, that toy. So yeah. they're, the, they're the driver. Um, hmm. Whereas on the gift business, it's usually a parent walks into or a, or a husband, a wife, 
um, will walk into a store and think that product would be ideal for uncle, grandma, grandpa, son, daughter, husband, yeah. wife. You know, yeah. so there is a there is a subtle difference. And um, we sold licensed brands, science museum, natural history museum. We had a Mensa, which we put on puzzles. But but a lot of the products were really sourced products out of Asia. They weren't oh, wow. items that we developed from the ground up. You know, they yeah. were stuff that already existed. We'd go to the trade fairs. Yeah. We would source products, and then we would put them under those brand names. Okay. And so it wasn't strictly brand slapping, but it wasn't far off. And yeah. uh, we would tweak products, improve products, and – after four or five years of doing this and the business growing well, we we had this yearning, we had this absolute desire to be more wow, to, to come up with stuff that nobody had done before. And obviously, if you go into a trade show and you're seeing products, it's because they've been done. So yeah. we want to create things from scratch. And and two of my, uh, my two co-founders, Graham and Kenny, they're both scientists, uh, environmental scientists, in their background and inventors uh, at their foreground, you know, that's what they're wow. about. So I met these two guys having sold a business, a business which I've not mentioned yet, another business that I had uh, in in e-commerce and e-commerce platforms. So from wow. the sports business, I went into other things. Um, and um, I was sort of semi-retired, I suppose, yeah. I was looking for something to do. And I met these two guys. They were at the Harrogate Gift Fair, so a gift fair in the north of England. And they looked like university, they looked like older university students. So they were in their 30s, ripped yeah. jeans, ripped jeans and t shirts before that was really even fashionable. That's all they could yeah. and, uh, and And they'd been working um, in uh, South Asia for non-government organizations ngos helping uh, poorer people and communities and oh. that's really at the heart of what of what they were about uh, but they got this big desire to to go into in, the inventing world and create things that had never been done before yeah and their first product was inspired by living together in in their university digs and they had uh, two bedrooms, a lounge come kitchen diner, and one bathroom. So the two of them yeah. were sharing the digs. And they had, would you believe, one bath towel for the first, <laughs> for the first few weeks. They really were students. <laughs> yeah, typical students. And it was it was through, um, you know, like a lot of great inventions are born through necessity. Um, they they came up with an idea for a new type of towel. So I'm at this Harrogate gift fair and they've got a table piled high with these bath, bath towels. Yeah. Um, it was an invented bath towel by then, uh, quite different to your normal bath towel. And it solved the problem that they'd encountered when they were sharing one towel. Mm -hmm. So when I opened it up and I was asking them, you know, have you sold many of these? Yeah, about five, 600 pieces. I thought that's pretty good. You know, uh, you know, um, over the period of the th two days of the show, until they said, "No, no, that's how many we've sold in the five years that we've been trying to get this product away." And in yeah, yeah, this know, sounds like a Dragon's Den episode or something. Yeah, yeah. Very, very much, very much. It felt like one. Yeah. Um, so, so I, I held up this towel. Half of the towel was was white and had the word "face" written on it, and the other half of the towel was brown. And it had the word arse written on it. And it was called the arse face towel. And of course, it, you know, it helped them um, keep as hygienic as possible when they're just using one, one towel. Uh, yeah. to share the and uh, anyway, I, 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 you had to laugh at the product and think, you know, it's yeah. a novelty item. Can it sell? Yeah. Well, at this point, I'd, I was just coming out of the business. I just sold the business but still had my contacts and, and the operation yeah. still going. So we put it on the front page of a brochure that we, that we used to send out selling novelty gifts and gadgets. Yeah. And we sold 10,000 of these in a week of this towel. Wow. Yeah. Um, 
we ended up selling in a week in wow. a week in a week we ended up selling be before we got underway properly with wow stuff over three years we sold around the world globally nearly five million of those towels wow it became it was it was adorned floor to ceiling in one of the rooms in the Australian Museum of Contemporary Art. It was, it's been on TV shows uh, wow. around the world. Um, it's, How did you first promote it, Richard? How did you first get all those sales? Well, it was from the, being on the front page of my, my brochure. I was, a, I was one of the early oh, wow. uh, internet businesses as well. So I, I, I built an internet business in 98, 99. Um, well, that's early. What was, the, what was the name of it? It was called boysstuff.co.uk. Yeah. Oh, yeah, wow. and it yeah. was um, yeah, gifts, gadgets, big boys, oh, yeah. toys. I we remember, it. I remember. Yeah, we bought Lazy Boy armchairs into the UK. Yeah, we yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, well, we sold all sorts of stuff, um, and it was great times. Um, wow. You know, I remember one Christmas, we were working flat out twenty four hours a day on shifts and sending out ten thousand parcels a day. So it was wow. right at the beginning of the internet, but we, yeah. we got a lot of things. Uh, right. We did a, a, a lot yeah. of things wrong, of course, as we were still all learning about e-commerce. And we built a really nice e-commerce platform, which went on to win e-commerce platform of the year for three wow. years. Wow. What a story. Yeah. I worked a little bit with uh, N Brown Group and Shop Direct Group up north. Big yeah. catalog businesses and stuff. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, well, I, ended cool. up, I ended up selling to those guys uh, um, quite a lot of products. Um, and they even inquired about purchasing my business you yeah. know, at the time. So, yeah. yeah, we had a lot of interest. Yeah. Wow. And um, what what advice would you give like um, budding entrepreneurs out there in terms of like, I guess, uh, growing successful businesses? Because, um, yeah, over your time. Well, um, you've got to go into it with your eyes wide open in the sense that you, you've got to know and, and, and understand that, that there is no easy way to make money as an entrepreneur. Yeah. And you will fail uh, many times in terms of there could be small fails that don't cost the business. So just mm. bumps the road. And sometimes there are complete failures where, you know, you're, you're running a business and it just doesn't work out. Yeah. And you've got, obviously got to know when to stop and conserve cash and get out. Yeah. But if you're a, an entrepreneur and you've got a taste for it, you will probably want to start again or do something similar again, maybe not the same industry, but taking the learnings from the failures. Because, yeah. you know, it is an old adage now in um, it, with entrepreneurs that you should treat failure as feedback. But, it, but it's mm. so true. There are always things you can learn and then be better next time around. America yeah. is is a fantastic home for entrepreneurs because it, it welcomes and supports entrepreneurs who failed once mm. or twice before because it believes that they will have learned a lot and they will not want to go there again. And and I think that's very true. When if you've had a failure, it it, it it's really painful. It hurts mm. your pride, your ego. Um, you know, which of course can be dangerous as well. You know, having an ego if it gets out of control, but it but it hurts you, and and yeah. you learn more from that. In in the same way that as we as we grow up as kids, and the first time you learn that to touch something hot hurts. Yeah, yeah. You touch you touch a hot oven or a, a hot mm. plate, and you pull back. Well, yeah. You know, you, you know, you're careful next time around, and you know. Yeah. So you, you know. Yes, yes, it hurt. Yes, you got that wrong. But boy, did you learn from it. And I'm a big believer that you learn best through doing and and you learn best through failing so that yeah. you never want to go there again. Yeah. Oh, you know, cool. Someone tells you the plate's hot. You yeah. might still be tempted to just check for yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Exactly. Like, yeah. So, so, you know, you get that, get that experience. So, you know, the question was, you know, what would my advice be to entrepreneurs? Start young start early mm. fail fast learn and then move on yeah cool great advice and then once you're actually getting established and growing the business 
like uh, a lot of people talk about is a people process or technology um, that like helps you scale the business. Uh, what ones were most important to you over your years um, with growing businesses? Well, all three play, play a big part, but, you know, um, again, another old saying, you, you know, you come across loads of these old sayings when, you, when you've been in uh, business for as long as I have. And, um, you know, everybody else, I'm sure, is familiar with these. But there's three things um, that you absolutely have to focus on in building a business and scaling it. And that is, number one, people. Uh, number two, people. And number three, people. Um, it's like fight club. The three yeah, fight right. club. <laughs> exactly right. Yes, <laughs> but you know, my 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 failings have have been, you know, my failures, I should say, and has been yeah. my failing. My failures has been when I've got the people wrong. You know, yeah. when it, it can be subtle when you look back on things and you think, okay, what was the point where this started to go wrong or we had a problem? And you can mm. pretty much always trace it back to people. You know, yeah. and, it, and it doesn't mean they're bad people. Um, it, it might be you've got a great person, but doing the yeah. wrong job. Yeah. You might have had a great person who've been there promoted above and beyond their own capabilities, but you didn't want to yeah. let them go. Um, yeah. They wanted more money, and so you gave them extra responsibility, but they yeah. weren't up to it. So there's loads of ways that you can fail with people, you know. Yeah. And um, but it doesn't mean the people themselves are failures. As a boss, yeah. you know the book the buck stops with you. And mm. uh, I think that is the single biggest learning. And as many times as uh, I hear it, and as many times I feel as many people that I see in business hear it, yeah. sometimes they forget it. We all forget. Yeah. You know, people is everything, you know, and uh, yeah. managing them well, um, making sure they're doing the right things, uh, making sure, you know, you measure the things that people and companies do, you know, because yeah. through measurement you can manage and through management yeah. you get things done. Yeah. With that point, right, like I guess what you're talking about there is like um, uh, good, the, uh, picking the right things to measure people on and then setting a good cadence for it. Um, how do you, do you do that like in a quarterly basis or how do you do it? Yeah. Um, we, we've got various, um, I suppose, procedures now in place within the business yeah. to ensure people are accomplishing, um, you know, their objectives. Mm. So, you know, we'll, I mean, wow, we're a, we're a business of lists. It's something I go on yeah. about. You, you, know, you put that on LinkedIn recently about like uh, that Sunday Times article and stuff. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, I, I was inspired um, before I had my first retail business, which was a the boys stuff, e-commerce business. I was inspired by a, another entrepreneur, very successful entrepreneur called Julian Richer. And I, I'd been, or I was going on holiday, I remember. And uh, I had my, I just sold uh, the shooting sports business. Yeah. We were jetting off on holiday. I was at the airport looking for something to take with me to read, picked up his book um, that had recently come out. I, and I'd not been in retail. I'd sold two retailers but mm. I'm not a retailer myself. Um, but I, I thought this looks an interesting book. And I was absolutely inspired. So the week, the week or two weeks I was away, I finished the book, came back invigorated and thought, wow, it's all about um, looking after your people, um, mm. measuring um, their, their objectives. And then you can manage from that. And from that, things get done. And a, and a whole host of... Um, ways that he went about running and managing his business and businesses yeah and he you know he, he learned the hard way you know as he says in his book he was bust at the age of about 19 i think so he'd gone into business for a year similar to me he got backed by an, a successful entrepreneur from the photographic industry so mm. um he got backed by a guy in london i got backed by a guy in the midlands and um he was doing quite well, but he didn't keep his finger on the button. He didn't keep his eye on the detail. He didn't yeah. get, you know, his monthly in, in, incomes and his outgoings and a whole yeah. host of things. So, of course, at the end of a year, first year or year and a half, he realized he was bust. Um, but yeah. he learned a huge amount and um, became a lifelong learner of business. And, and the things that he learned, he stuck by, very disciplined. So I was inspired hmm 
by all the different teachings um, that he he summed up as the richer way. Uh, in Is that the name of the book? That's the name of the book. That's the name of the yeah. way he does things in his business. Uh, his, his main business is Richer Sounds. So yeah. um, I was inspired by that and, and seeing an article out the blue just a few weeks ago uh, that he yeah. re reminded me of why I do to-do lists because it yeah. related back, you know, sort of 25 years before yeah. having read his book and, and him saying how he did his, his to-do lists. And, of course, I found that so productive then when I started yeah. using a similar system to him. So I now preach that within my business um, quite a lot. But that's just one of, uh, just like his business, one of many things that we do in how yeah. we work with our colleagues. And, yeah. uh, you know, so we have listening groups, uh, we have uh, boxes, we have, you know, a whole host of, of different yeah. things that ultimately all come together to build um, the culture within the company, the, yeah. way that we, the way that we do things. Yeah, cool. Do you constantly reprioritize those lists? Like you're constantly looking at where is what? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm a little old school in that I still use a uh, a paper to do list, as again as Julian does. Um, yeah. So I've got something in front of me here. I'm just sort of giving you a typical glance. I don't know whether the camera well, can, can, can see it. Yeah. Um, so on the left side here is my calendar in view for the week with wow. all my meetings. So I've got then a list of yeah. all my meetings. I've got my to dos down here. They're constantly yeah. reprioritized. As the oh, day wow. goes by and as the week goes by. great. Yeah, yeah. And, that's, too. and that, I, that's also synced with my phone uh, and the diary. So the electronic diary is checked every day. Anything new going in goes into this. So I can wow. you know, open this up in a moment and know where I am. This yeah. never crashes. And like a computer, it never crashes. Yeah. Instant to open it. I don't have to wait for it to boot up. Um, yeah. It's waterproof. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah. sort of you can buy it on wow stuff and do <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah so uh, yeah yeah so uh, oh, I'm that's great that. absolutely yeah. you know yes yeah. a big cool. number of and then back to the people point right um it, you have to hire them well and then you have to manage them well any tips for people on those two things um well it's it, it, the biggest uh, piece there is, as you just said, it's the hiring. So you've yeah. got to put more time than you can possibly imagine into the, 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 the bit mm. of the, beginning, the hiring, you know, the brief, what you're looking for, what kind of person you want. You know, have a whole list of interview questions. For, for, for me, it's to try and get down to the attitude, aptitude of the person to see if they're a good cultural fit. So that's what yeah. I'm looking for. Now, my colleagues who will recruit for the specific position will be looking for have they got the right skills, um, yeah. the right abilities for that particular role and responsibilities. I look yeah. for that cultural fit. So yeah. I'm, that, that's that. You know, so my, you know, my tip to anybody, you know, running a business as an entrepreneur is what type of a, a business leader are you? you yeah, know, are you the person? You know, you'll have two or three things that you're exceptionally good at. You, you might be lucky and have lots of things. I, I'm not that lucky. I'm not very yeah. good at 80% of the things that our company does, maybe even 90 odd percent. So, so look at what you're good at and then obviously bring in people to do all those other things who are brilliant and better than you at those other things. Um, so I, I'm looking really for the cultural fit. Is that yeah. a wow stuffer? You wow, know? that's uh, cool. You know, will, will they fit in with the team? Do they share the same values, uh, yeah. integrity, you know, all those different things. Yeah, great. And then, um, yeah, finishing up, like uh, one question is, uh, what are you most proud of in your career over the years? Uh, in my career? Um, I mean, family, definitely, you know, my family is everything, yeah. you know, and that's what I now do everything for, um, my, my kids and, and my wife. Um, in terms of career, what am I? I'm most proud right now, sitting here, of the the team that we have, um, the the fact that we have perhaps delivered largely on that vision of people who in, really enjoy working with their colleagues. Yeah, you know, I mean, I know it won't be perfect, it won't be, but I know also from the feedback. And working with them and the excitement and the energy that they must overall like what they're doing. And yeah. you can see that then 
in productivity and the types of products that we create. So overall, I'm most proud of the company. You know, I've, I've been proud of the various companies that I've been involved with. They've not always been yeah. as successful as I've wanted. Um, but, you know, on the whole, they have. And, and, you know, it's the people that made that. Equally, just one last thing, you know, about nothing's ever a, a perfect linear or sorry straight yeah. straight up ride to the top in 2012 we lost a huge amount of money 2012 13 14 uh, we took in private equity investment because we were such a fast-growing business on the outside it, it you know we were a, a poster boy really for yeah. SME entrepreneurial run businesses so we got offered money by lots of different investors and, and acquirers. So we took one uh, and they were they were good people, but they were a brand new private equity firm and they hadn't got their mm. own people in place at that point. And, um, you know, to any listener, if you are looking at getting an investor in, you know, really think hard about what it is you're looking for. In our case, we wanted the cash to grow and to scale, but we also wanted um, help with hiring people. Mm. and we rushed it, and they didn't have their HR team in place to help us with that, mm. which is what helps you then scale. And we recruited a lot of people not from the toy industry. They were good people. Uh, they weren't bad people. Um, but, you know, it then takes them a year, year and a half to understand the industry, and you don't have that time when you're hitting the ground running in, a, in what is like almost like a fast, fast, fast fashion business, everything changing very quick. Um, so um, we had a big fall, you know, we, uh, we lost money. Um, and, but fortunately, because the relationship was, was intact with the investors, they knew that we had high integrity, um, mm. that we both did things wrong. They allowed us to buy the business back at a very, very reasonable price to be able to oh, continue wow. to go. And in return, I kept them with some shares um, that they perhaps weren't expecting. Um, so that was a big lesson. You know, again, it's the people thing. I took mm. my eye on Paul in, in, you know, we just threw people into the business to help us scale. Yeah. You yeah. Know? There's no silver bullet, is there, for anything? Uh, yeah. Sometimes what goes up fast comes down fast. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Very good. Wow. Richard, this has been an amazing talk. Uh, yeah. Uh, one of the uh, biggest entrepreneurs in the UK, most successful. So yeah, thank you so much for coming on board. Thank you very much, Dennis. I've enjoyed it. Yeah, great. Thanks, Richard.